we completed a shirt postdoc at Concordia University. And her, uh, the title of her uh, shirt grant was uh, leveraging, uh, I should say she's in the Department of History and the Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling. And uh, the shirt grant was leveraging inclusion and diversity as Canada's digital advantage. And she's going to be talking about history in the media. Thank you. Um, Canada's ability to succeed in the digital economy, or however we imagine our future, is tied to our ability to live and to work collaboratively. Humanities and social science researchers can offer policy makers a people-centered and practice-based approach to technological innovation, as Chad was, was discussing. Oral and public historians are particularly well-placed in this regard, given that our work has long sought to incorporate analog and digital technologies into our research practice and to connect people to their stories as well as to those told by others. My brief remarks this morning will therefore consider the emerging place of new media in oral and public history. At present, I believe, as well as my team, that we have an incredible opportunity to deploy digital tools and new media practices to reconnect Canadians with their past. The power of oral and public history is their ability to put a face, a name, and a voice to the past. It makes it personal and it makes it meaningful. This is important given that most people are now seeking a heritage that is interactive, participatory, and living. They want to be able to access history as they walk through their cities and towns with their smartphones and their iPads in hand. Despite the fact that we are at an exciting moment in time, my team found that disciplinary structures have been slow to change with societal developments. For the most part, university-based research remains trapped in old structures that hinder our ability to put Canadians in di dialogue with their past. Although Concordia University Center for Oral History and Digital Storytelling, where I am situated, is creating exciting interdisciplinary and collaborative community university spaces of inquiry that are enabling researchers to go public with their work and redefine the research process itself, few have access to places like this. Oral and public historians are fully aware of the trans transformative power of new media and are incredibly excited by the possibilities, but they face major hurdles when it comes to adop adoption namely a lack of training, time constraints, limited funding, and a perception that their digital endeavors are not being recognized by institutional structures. As one of our respondents noted, and this is a quote, everyone wants to adopt digital technologies, but no one quite knows how to go forward. We must begin to address the power implicit in new media because we are living in a period that is and will continue to be dominated by ubiquitous and pervasive computing. To do this, my team came up with several recommendations. First, we believe that Heritage Canada and other departments of the federal government, as well as SHRC, have a vital role to play in creating the conditions in which history and heritage organizations, as well as university-based researchers, can effectively tell Canada's story. Financial resources are key to shifting the nation's research culture and output. The Canadian government also needs to initiate a large-scale digitization program aimed at digitizing all of the massive audio and video holdings of Canadian archival and heritage institutions. Important stories from the past are out there, but they are becoming increasingly inaccessible and their long-term preservation is at risk. In a related issue, national best practice guidelines are needed for data management and preservation. Although the explosion of widely available digital tools democratizes the creation of projects, the absence, absence of established guidelines makes it difficult to make informed choices or to even move forward with any kind of confidence. Capabil capability among and between tools needs to be a priority as well. Oral and public historians are quite hesitant about adopting tools that offer no such guarantee. Even if the software they consider is stable, supported, and continues to evolve, they are acutely aware of the absence of standards and the inability to migrate their work to other menus or to, to other tools. This issue, we believe, cannot be ignored. Additionally, the funding of new media tools has to be envisioned as a sustained process. Development must go hand in hand with training and support. Furthermore, new digital research tools and phone applications being created with the support of taxpayer money should be accessible to all Canadians. To, faci to facilitate access and encourage cross-fertilization, we <coughs> suggest that SHRC and Heritage Canada team up to develop an online humanities and social sciences digital tools and phone applications store modeled on the popular iPhone store. It would, we believe, quickly become a go-to place for researchers and public history institutions, not only in Canada, but around the world. 
a variable showcase of Canadian innovation and digital applications and research. Another roadblock to the adoption of technology is the cost, not only of software, but also of server space. Either as a centralized system or through the community university collaborations that we imagine we establish, the adoption of cloud computing would help resolve this issue. Ultimately, our research suggests that if we are going to tackle barriers to digital development, then we must invest in collaborative relationships. People are our primary sources of innovation, and so Canada's digital future is closely tied to our ability to work and live collaboratively over the long haul. Thank you. to uh, remind you that there is a one-page uh, handout uh, which points to a fuller report. Uh, I say that because I'm a slow talker who sometimes goes off on a tangent, so if I do that, uh, the full report is, is there for you. Um, I want to, I want to uh, help you imagine with me something that's happening right now. As education, I'm concerned about young people. And so today out in uh, Canada's schools, uh, you'll have a group of students who are probably right now circling errors on a grammar worksheet. One group of students is probably doing that, and they're learning about comma faults and comma splices, prepositional phrases, and so on. There's probably another group of students who are out on a track and field meet, and they are running the 100 meter dash, and they're hoping to qualify for district events, and then provincial events, and so forth. Uh, and then there's another group whose words are being hung up uh, on the wall uh, for everybody to gather around and so on. And there's another group of students that are probably in a digital arts media lab. And what I want to do for you is somehow connect all of these four scenarios uh, to the research findings that we have. And primarily the question that we set out to examine is to what degree can young people have uh, experiences in schools which give them an opportunity to leverage their words, images, and text to be part of uh, the expertise uh, in an economy where their words matter? Because that's what teachers do. Teachers for all kinds of, certainly writing teachers have said, words matter. Uh, but today, it's not just words, it's not just their texts, and the ways that they matter are so much broader and faster. What our research discovered is that for that one group where the words are being put up on the wall, teachers have the right idea. Words need to be public, they need to be shared, they need to be viewed, they need to get out there into the world. And yet, they're not quite imagining the public space where students' words could be. Participating in a digital economy, students' words can uh, be out there in the public beyond just Facebook and Twitter. There's the opportunity for their words to be part of a media kind of exchange, and we're hoping that teachers can start to imagine a different public uh, where students can learn to write better, learn to communicate, and leverage those skills uh, for a Canadian digital economy. The other thing that we found is that those students running the track meet in the 100 meter dash, schools have a tremendous infrastructure that is rarely strategically aligned with what's happening in other kinds of exciting ventures. So why is it, for example, that students don't typically have the opportunity to take digital media and participate in district, provincial, national kinds of events. Um, place our words on the wall in the classroom. Our classrooms can be so much larger. We have the potential and the youth imagination now is so much larger than it used to be. 
I'll give you a quick example. Uh, Prince Edward Island is a result of some of this uh, work that we did. We're looking at a project called One Book, One Island. In the old days, which wasn't that old, I would go to the book room and pick the book off the shelf called The Outsider, and I would put it in front of my students, and we'd read it, and that would pretty much be the end of it. What I'm suggesting now is we have the infrastructure in place in schools for an entire province, for perhaps an entire nation of young people, to read a book together all at once and talk online, that these kinds of experiences are the kinds of things that will prepare them to better contribute to a digital economy and be successful in and just to summarize briefly, um, I was trained as an English teacher. I took a course in Shakespeare, I took a course in grammar and so on. I think a good measure of success is when I'm no longer relevant, when I can't get into a teacher training school. Much better would be teacher training programs where uh, you need digital media experience, you need animation experience, you need to be able to pull all of that together so that the kinds of experienced teachers that we have in front of our young people are no longer the exception to the rule. Uh, they need different kinds of skill sets that, that we shared and integrated. And I, I'm sure I'm over time. Thank you very much. Uh, I trust you can hear me okay. Um, so our uh, knowledge census paper uh, looked at uh, the current state and the challenges facing uh, the ICT industry in Canada. We have a number of uh, very substantial strengths, obviously digital media and content, uh, but also in e-health technology. IT security, and uh, for several decades we've had very great strength in uh, what are called fabless semiconductors. Um, the ICT industry is quite substantial in Canada, it represents almost 5% of the gross domestic product, uh, but one of the main characteristics is that it's composed primarily of small and medium-sized enterprises, almost 79%. Um, are, are based in the software and computer service industries. And as um, Chad was pointing out uh, in his presentation, there's been a, a steady shift from uh, manufacturing to services as a share of the ICT sector. Um, and in particular, the 2008 recession hit the manufacturing part of the, uh, the industry very, very hard. Um, and in addition, 42% uh, of the workers in this industry have university degrees as compared to 24% nationally for all industries. Um, but there are a number of challenges uh, facing this industry. Uh, we don't have enough uh, flagship firms, uh, leadership firms that uh, provide a basis for smaller firms to uh, follow in their wake, so to speak, and penetrate international markets. Uh, there's been a relative hollowing out of the ICT industry, particularly with the collapse and uh, virtual disappearance of Nortel. Uh, even though the ICT industry is the strongest R&D performer in Canada, um, Canada as a whole seriously underperforms on research and development investment and lags in innovation. Um, the country also seriously lags the U.S. in productivity increases, and a substantial part of that lag has been attributed to a failure. Uh, to in, of other sectors to adopt uh, information and communications technologies and apply them in their businesses. Um, the venture capital industry has been in a slow, steady state of decline for the past decade, and um, although there have been a number of government programs put in place, a lot of these are matching programs that require private funding, and there's been a decline of, uh, uh, of those private funds. Um, there's a shortage of highly skilled workers uh, in the industry. Uh, and finally, uh, the digital in infrastructure is seriously lagging. Even though we were widely considered to be a leader in the 1980s, our international status has changed dramatically over the past decade. 
Uh, there was a p report that came out from McKinsey just a week ago, which listed Canada as eight out of the G8 countries in uh, internet penetration, which is a troubling sign. Um, so in the submissions to the uh, consultation paper for Industry Canada, there were a number of uh, very valuable and useful recommendations which we summarized briefly in our paper. Uh, it included uh, a need for better alignment of intergovernmental coordination and support for the industry, particularly between the federal government and the provinces. Um, the need to set strategic targets for the growth of ICT firms in Canada. One submission called for the creation of 20 firms with sales above $1 billion by 2017. Uh, there's a greater need to use procurement as a catalyst for the adoption and use of ICTs, that is public procurement. Um, there's a, uh, a call for better financial incentives and sub subsidies to stimulate the adoption and use of information and communication technologies, uh, particularly uh, things like tax exemptions for companies that are increasing their adoption of ICT productivity uh, tools. And finally, uh, one of the reports, actually the one from the Council of Canadian Academies that Chad also referred to earlier, called for the creation of something called a Digital Transformation Assistance Program modeled along the uh, National Research Council's very successful uh, IRAP, or Industrial Research Assistance Program. Um, that's the only one that I've seen some evidence that may actually uh, occur. There was a uh, reference to a program that sounded a lot like that in the March 22nd federal budget, and with any luck, we'll see it again in next week's budget. Thank you. Um, my, uh, my study was taking a look at uh, digital uh, media developments in other countries and, and looking at what lessons there might be to, to learn from, uh, from other countries. And uh, the first, um, first question I was asked to answer is what did I find? And the, the first point would be that we have a lot to learn from what's happening in other countries, particularly uh, other countries in Asia. Um, a number of countries have identified digital media as being a key part of their national innovation strategies, what they refer to, which is another word really for their economic development plans, and uh, digital content within their digital media strat strategy, uh, or within their um, digital media strategy, is a very key part of that. So other governments uh, around the world are working in conjunction with the private sector, committing a lot of money and a lot of talent to uh, developing the sector. So what are some of the things that they're, uh, that they're doing? Um, one of the, the key things uh, is, for a number of countries, they've identified uh, main agencies that are, that are in charge of uh, promoting and developing uh, digital media. So I've just given you a list of them there. Again, quite a number of them are, are in Asia. But agencies who uh, have put in a lot in the way of resources to help develop the sector, work with the private sector, often move people back and forth from private sector to government to kind of develop strategies and come up with ways that they can help. Uh, help their, um, uh, their country sector uh, develop. Most of them focus on uh, the development of the industry, promotion of their, their companies and their, uh, and their products, and cultivation of, uh, cultivation of talent within the, within the sector. Uh, a big part, uh, was just referred in the last one, that Canada is not doing uh, all that well in the uh, area of infrastructure. And again, for many countries, a, a real big focus on infrastructure under, underscores their digital media uh, sector. Basically, I think Taiwan puts it, uh, put it well by saying, um, uh, basically, broad, uh, bandwidth first, content later. Now, they do an awful lot on the content front, but their first focus was making sure that they brought the, uh, the bandwidth and the bandwidth um, availability across 
uh, across their, uh, the country. Um, even countries like Finland that have the same kind of challenges Canada has, which is you know a very dispersed uh, population and a very sort of rural uh, rural population. Um, other, uh, other area where there's some really interesting things is countries with uh, what I'm calling kind of um, showcase facilities, where they've got uh, a big area or a big center with a huge focus on digital media that they use to try to draw attention to the, to the sector. Um, examples are um, Korea's Digital Media City, um, a relatively uh, new development, but I just visited there uh, in April. Uh, you know, amazing, amazing place where they're trying to bring together all of their digital media companies, a few foreign companies, but primarily domestic. Uh, they've got a digital media street where um, every company, as part of getting the kind of lower rent for locating there, has to have a kind of visible presence, uh, digital um, displays on uh, digital displays, interactive things to show people how to work with their technology. Um, uh, Cyber Jaya in, um, in Malaysia, uh, China has something like 11 animation parks. So there's some really um, fascinating things happening in uh, some of these other places. Uh, talent promotion would be another area in which some interesting things are happening um, around the world. Um, countries that have all kinds of programs to um, support companies, but also to develop. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about is the fact that Canada doesn't have enough people who are trained in uh, to work in some of these areas. So some countries have all kinds of initiatives to try to train people so that they've got enough people to work in the sector in the, in the future. Uh, mentoring programs, um, content accelerator centers. One of my favorites is um, even storytelling competitions to try to get people to get better practice at writing stories that then you use in games and, uh, and uh, film and that kind of thing. Uh, bold visions, bold digital visions. A number of countries with really uh, big statements about what they want to achieve in their, in their digital sector. Um, I've uh, listed a few there. Digital Britain, uh, the Knowledge Society Strategy for Finland. Um, uh, Korea have big plans to be one of the top, uh, to remain one of the top three gaming countries in the world. So big, bold statements in which they try to kind of inspire the, the sector and inspire the country. Uh, key legislation as well um, about what they're planning to do with their uh, with their sector. So um, what are so the second question was sort of what are the uh, what are the lessons for uh, for Canada? I guess the first and the big lesson is that we need to pay more attention to what's happening in the rest of the world. We don't do enough of actually paying attention to um, um, what Canada is doing in kind of a comparative context. Uh, many countries making major uh, major national investments in training and business development, um, doing a lot to focus on this shift that um, that Chad referred to to the to the, um, the, the um, to users, to the whole focus of how you develop the digital content um, sector. There's some really interesting things happening in Asia about uh, culturally specific markets. So countries who, uh, not just within digital media, are looking at particular countries that they see as being their market. Uh, Malaysia focusing on uh, Islamic countries, Taiwan focusing on China, um, Japan focusing domestically. So there's some really interesting differences across those, uh, across those kind of countries. And I guess the last point would be there, there's an awful lot happening in the rest of the world. The speed of the developments is, uh, is very rapid. And uh, so Canada needs to be paying attention to what's happening in the rest of the world to uh, help it develop its own strategies. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Shirk and Nancer, for having me here. And uh, I do acknowledge the great work of my colleagues, Susan, as my co investigator on the, on the project, and also uh, our partners, the Kuwait Nook, Kuki Maknak, otherwise or more popularly known as KNET, Athletic Canada, First Nation Help Desk, uh, the First Nation Education Council, and the First Nation Technology Council. And it was very much a, uh, a partnership. And I thought I would, uh, in the interest of time, someone advised me, get your big point out first, because you never know when you're going to get cut off. So in terms of what's different, I think in our project, we kind of embodied what's different about digital. Oops, buttons here. Um, and the first one was that we had credible, constructive contributions from very remote participants in this project. And and I think that digital is an enabling technology for participation. And that, that went into the, both the creation of the proposal and the 
and throughout the writing of, of the grant. And, uh, and it's, it just wouldn't have been possible uh, without the digital technologies. And, and, uh, and in particular, video conferencing are very similar to, to here. Um, the other thing is that those partners are not a bunch of other academics, but in fact are community partners. And they are not really in the business of doing research. They're in the business of delivering digital communications to their communities. But they contributed enormously in the writing. They were full uh, partners. And I think in this sense, the digital, the difference is that it's an equalizing uh, technology or an equalizing force in our society. And I think we've all probably felt that, that not only is our our words getting out to more people, blogs, tweets, whatever, but they're coming back to us from more people. So those are kind of two key differences that I think we're embodied in our project and our, um, uh, our, our differences of a digital. Main findings, uh, there are large numbers of people unserved and or, and or underserved in Canada in terms of digital connectivity. And uh, David mentioned that we rank class in G8 there's um, lots to be concerned about there. The other is that there's an ongoing challenge of fragmented and incomplete policy frameworks. Canada does many things in this regard, but they are often disconnected, partial, uh, not uh, don't get every the uh, complete story. They're cut off before people get finished, etc. That said, there are some amazing initiatives out there, and our partners uh, represent some of them, and many other uh, Aboriginal communities across Canada are, are doing some fantastic things to get themselves connected, and really the term first mile came from reconceptualizing. You've probably all heard of the word last mile, and you know, from the telephone company's perspective, the mile from their, their switch or whatever to the house is the last mile, and the last thing that gets built. And the, and so Aboriginal communities are trying to turn that on their head, not just um, because reframing the question changes what you can and will do with the technology. And they're starting to think of it as first mile and build that first, get your community connected. And then you have, in, in one thing is, is a lot of choice of how and when and where and for when and at what price you get connected. And so this is enabling some amazing local sustainable development. In terms of recommendations, we recommend an ongoing support for a combination of infrastructure. No, I'm not pushing the button. Uh, oops, no, I did push the button. Sorry. A combination of infrastructure and connectivity services. Sometimes these two things get bundled together in grants and policies and programs, but they are very different. And so infrastructure, you know, the wires and the fibers and the and so on, is not the same as, as connectivity services, which could include education, also, you know, just help desks and all the myriad of things that go into making connectivity realistic. Um, so, and for all these rationales, that they, they, that they enable a combination and, and support for both, enable service delivery, like health, government, education, core infrastructure, we need to look at this as core infrastructure, just like water. It's part of self-realization for communities, and of course, economic development. Um, so we, uh, to realize this, we built a website, the firstmile.ca website. I encourage you to visit it. Um, it's active and ongoing, and in fact, we built on this proposal with a, uh, a public outreach grant from uh, Sure to take this story out uh, and to get and to gather and, and to. Uh, more of these kind of first mile stories. Uh, we've done some collaboration with New Zealand Aboriginal communities who are regarding spectrum as a, as a treaty right, which as you can imagine would uh, cause a kerfuffle if that came into Canada. But uh, I tell you, this First Nations people jammed into our video conference about the topic. So uh, maybe we'll hear more about that. Uh, there's our website, and I encourage you to visit. And thank you for having us. Wendy Sukir, who's a professor and associate dean at the Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University. And the title of her presentation is Improving Canada's Digital Talent, Building the Digital Talent Pool and Skills for Tomorrow. Thank you, Wendy.
Thanks very much. Um, and I want to thank Mary for accommodating me at the very, very, very last minute uh, when I couldn't um, attend in person. So this project um, is based on a review of about 200 articles and about 100 national strategies. And we ask the question, what are essential digital skills? How are they defined? How are they measured um, around the world? And if I could have the next slide. One of the principal um, arguments that we make in the paper is that while many national strategies uh, tend to really focus on physical infrastructure, the human infrastructure is probably one of the key enablers to taking advantage of high-speed networks and also building the capacity to innovate, the content about advantage, and a strong ICT industry. So um, while some countries uh, mention digital skills, only about half as many as talk about physical infrastructure, and those that do seldom are very precise in their in their definitions. If I may have the next slide. What we found, sorry, could I have the next slide? Thanks. Um, this is uh, adapted from something the Media Awareness Network uh, developed, and we thought it was uh, a very good way of conceptualizing and communicating um, the layers of digital skills. So at, at the bottom, we see basic digital literacy. And here we're talking about not just uh, the skills needed to access networks, but also um, the, the um, critical skills needed and an understanding of things like digital rights and, and digital responsibility. That's foundational. And uh, what we found was in, and this has been mentioned already, in virtually every sector, but in virtually every discipline now, um, access to um, digital technologies is absolutely key. So you may be learning nursing, you may be learning, um, you may be learning um, uh, food sciences. Doesn't matter. Uh, access to digital skills is going to be critical in any discipline. So, so they're really foundational level skills. The next level, and this is the level that perhaps receives the least attention, but I would argue, and it's partly my own bias, that it's uh, fundamental, are the skills related to um, effective use of ICTs um, in in the business world. So this would include things like um, understanding of how to build markets. And it was interesting, this reference made to the, to the iPhone. The iPhone is rather uh, inferior technology if you looked at it from a purely functional engineering perspective. But it's brilliant from the point of view of um, understanding consumer markets and identity. And it's very obvious that in the current environment, to be successful, Canada cannot rely on traditional models of pushing technology from labs to market. We have to have a nuanced and granular understanding of markets and how people use technologies and, and so on. And that doesn't require um, deep technology skills. That requires the broad social sciences and humanities competencies. There are also the skills needed to build um, SMEs and, and uh, basic entrepreneurial and innovation skills. Again, whether these are, are companies in the ICT space or whether they're SMEs generally, there's a whole set of skills that are actually fundamental that again tend to be left out of the out of the list. And then of course there are issues around um, thinking about technology as a user in order to enable uh, the development of other products and services. If we move to the top of the pyramid and talk about um, deep technical and content creation skills. All too often, I think, in Canada and elsewhere, there's a, there's a preoccupation with science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, um, and an, a, a lack of attention focused on things like content creation. And so we think that it's critical to recognize in our digital skills strategy 
that the STEM disciplines are important, but, but so are the others. Next slide, please. We've heard a lot, next slide, sorry. We've heard a lot um, about the uh, skills shortage um, globally. We found that there's more evidence of a skills mismatch because on the one hand you have companies saying we don't have um, we don't have the skills that we need in order to do to be successful. On the other hand, we see um, engineers and computer scientists driving taxis. So there's there are clearly issues around the matching of the available workforce and the skills that are required. And there's also a need, I think the research shows for um, a much more critical perspective on what the skills are that are required. Very often there's been an assumption that because we always had an engineer or a computer scientist doing this, we need a computer scientist or an engineer without doing um, an analysis of what the jobs actually entailed. And increasingly there's evidence of a burgeoning demand for hybrids who have some understanding of technology but also have soft skills, project management skills, and so on. I won't talk about the digital divide and the underrepresentation of different groups because I know that Yuta is going to um, speak about that and Richard has already um, made some reference to issues in Aboriginal communities. But what I would say is that when we're looking at um, the skills shortage, the shortage or mismatch, we really need to be careful about our, uh, our definition and not necessarily accept uh, what we're being told, particularly by industry, which has a vested interest in keeping labor costs down. Next slide, please. Um, the measurement of uh, digital literacy is really underdeveloped, and while we see measurements for the basic level of the, the pyramid referenced in much of the literature, it's not very sophisticated. Very often, it really only focuses on access, um, can someone get on the internet, which is really not sufficient. When we look at the middle level of that pyramid I showed you, there's almost nothing in place, although uh, the European eSkills Forum did talk about e-business skills as being um, a core set of competencies and try to measure them, measure them. And when we look at the measurement of deep technology skills, what we see most often is just simple counting of the number of computer scientists and engineers. And while I don't disagree that we have to do everything that we can to increase um, the availability of engineers and computer scientists and the number of girls who choose those professions and so on as ways of expanding that pool, um, it's a mistake to use that as the only metric of deep technology skills. The next slide, please. So, if we look at uh, if we look at strategies, there are a wide range of stakeholders that need to be um, engaged, and this ranges from community libraries and organizations through universities and employers and so on to really address um, a strategy that's nuanced and and uh, precise. I won't go through these in in great detail other than to really highlight um, the importance of making sure that we don't let the averages mask some of the huge disparities. So if you look at, for example, the overall percentage of Canadians who have um, the skills needed to use the internet on a regular basis for a variety of, of purposes, that can really mask huge gaps between people based on age, based on geography, based on socioeconomic status, etc. And I think the last um, point in some ways is the most important, and that is that we have to start early. The evidence is very clear that young people start making decisions about um, what they're good at and what their identity is in terms of words versus numbers and, and technology at a very, very early age. And if we're serious about a digital skills strategy, we really have to start at a very early, um, early age in the school system and, and cover the entire range of uh, secondary, post-secondary, and lifelong learning opportunities. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, and can everyone hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to invite you to visit the website idrc.ocad.ca to view the, the full details of this report, as I'm going to be going through quite a number of uh, things found during our study in, in fairly fast order. There is a phenomenon that's well known in the accessibility field called the digital curb cut. Curb cuts are those ramps and sidewalks that were initially created to make it possible for wheelchairs to get up onto the sidewalk, but are used by everyone with wheeled things, including baby carriages, rollerblades, and shopping carts. Digital curb cuts refer to digital innovations that were originally created or designed for people with disabilities, but that benefit everyone email, text captions, loudspeakers, voice recognition, and text-to-speech are among the things that were initiated to address disabilities, but that we depend upon at the moment. An innovation intended to address digital exclusion for people with disabilities here in Canada is also proving to be a digital curb cut for young entrepreneurs, indie developers, low-income countries, anyone having difficulty in formal education, individuals with literacy barriers, people who are technology shy, and even people who want to reduce waste. It promises to have a major impact on prosperity and on innovation. Digital exclusion has been identified as a major threat to prosperity and well-being globally. In the US, it has been recently estimated that digital exclusion costs more than 55 billion annually. Digital inclusion has again been identified as a top priority for all member nations at the recent WISIS meeting. One of the groups most affected are people with disabilities. People with disabilities are facing a growing technology gap. The specialized industry that is building the assistive technologies intended to bridge the gap between the design of standard digital systems and the requirements of people with disabilities are not able to keep up with technical advances and are confounded by increasingly distributed and fra fragmented development. As a result, while standard ICT is continuously improving in functionality, reliability, and availability, and decreasing in cost, assistive technology is increasing in cost, decreasing in functionality, reliability, and availability. Assistive technologies are also only available in 28% of the world. In the rest of the world, they're neither sold, maintained, or cost more than 50% of your annual income. At the same time as this is occurring, the incidence of disability is increasing globally due to an aging demographic in Western nations, natural and man-made disasters, and improved survival rates in the rest of the world. To make matters worse, the special services intended to assist these individuals have been found to spend more in policing the services and excluding individuals who might not qualify than in actually delivering the services. If something transformational isn't done soon, digital exclusion will only worsen, and the social and economic impacts are seen to be disastrous. Another group, surprisingly, that is facing barriers at the moment is young entrepreneurs, small companies, indie developers, low-income countries, anyone that cannot get over the major hurdle required to enter the current market. We are in an extreme push market. Whatever figures you look at, what is spent in pushing products rather than producing, let alone innovating, is fairly shocking. Most new enterprises cannot afford the initial investment. At the same time, the market is not diversifying. The needs of consumers with marginal needs are not being met because to survive, most producers need to try to grab the largest market. Consequently, productivity, innovation, and equitable prosperity suffer. So what is this digital curb cut that will address the needs of people with disabilities as well as young entrepreneurs and emerging markets? The notion is very simple. It involves creating a network and in some cases cloud enables pipeline between individual requirements or demands and diverse supply or production to deliver one size fits one user interfaces and content configurations to each individual in every context that they, they might find themselves in. 
It is based on implementations pioneered here in Canada to service uh, cast sites or community access points. So when someone who's blind steps up to a kiosk, the kiosk will speak the commands and the control key will be in locations that person is familiar with. When someone with literacy barriers logs onto a government services site, the text will be spoken and the system will fill in the forms. When a student who is hard of hearing views an instructional video, it is delivered with captions customized to their individual reading level. And on the other side, the young user interface developer can identify and respond to gaps in meeting user interface needs without the upfront commercialization and marketing costs. The research pilots connect the full ecosystem of producers or suppliers, including crowdsourcing, open source, public services, and paid services. Because the full diversity of user needs can be expressed, this is already resulting in greater diversity of production. With this system, the delivery um, with this system of delivery, individuals with disabilities need not qualify for special services, need not explain or justify their needs, and need not fit in constrained categories of services. And anyone who did not qualify for special services because they did not fit the criteria will still receive the user interface and content they need. The European Commission, the US administration, UNESCO, ITU, and many other jurisdictions are investing in this curve cut. Canada is being looked to as the nexus of the infrastructure needed to support this one size fits one pipeline and as the pioneer in this area of design. This curve cut addresses every sector and application affected by the digital transformation. The research questions, are, as you can imagine, are mammoth and touch every discipline, including disciplines we've not even thought of before. Um, in, con in conclusion, I'd like to add to Chad's point, the digital transformation that we're facing at the moment enables us to consider and address the needs of the who down to the individual. It frees us to let go of categories, binaries, and the divide between the mainstream and special services. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. We have time for one question, and I'd just like to emphasize that after the uh, session today, uh, most of the presenters will be available for informal discussions. Is there a 